so kind of excited about today, even though kind of a troublesome, it was a troublesome topic. We're going to look at what's called Newton's method. Uh, it's also sometimes called newton rapson method. I guess Rapson got in there later, and now he's been demoted. Uh, it, it, it started making me think, gee, all these things with Newton's name on them. You know, we have Newtonian mechanics. Any of you taking physics or taking physics know about that? Uh, let's see, there's, well, there's, you know, along with that, there's Newton's gravity. There's something called the Newton ring. Anyone run into a Newton ring? Uh, I not cover that in physics anymore. It's an optical thing where you have some lenses and you get these rings. Called Newton rings. And, uh, and I was thinking, well, there's the fig Newton. And I thought, no, it can't be. Well, actually, it isn't. <laughs> it, it's called the fig Newton because it comes, came from Newton, Massachusetts. And Newton, Massachusetts didn't get its name from Newton either. Contraction of Newtown, Massachusetts. So, right, get rid of that. He's not, he's not responsible for everything. But Newton did a lot. And uh, he came up this, with this thing we're, we're going to talk about Newton's method. Oh, I'm supposed to. Uh, I'm supposed to indicate what section this is, and I don't know. So, uh, uh, so we're going to dance around this a lot today. But what is Newton's, Newton's method? Uh, and what's it for? You have some function. Uh, mostly we're going to look at polynomials. It could be some other more complicated function that could have strict functions in it. And uh, it has roots. For some reason, either we don't want to or we can't just figure out that those roots are uh, in closed form. That can come up a lot. And there are various numerical methods that can find these roots. Uh, is anyone here not familiar with the idea of guess and check? You've not heard of guess and you haven't heard of guess and check? Okay, this is something they they would give you in like al early algebra. Like you would uh, have some equation like uh, you know, x plus three equals seven. This is really basic. And rather than first teach you the rules, you use the answer to say, well, we'll try something. Well, let's, let's try one. So one plus three is four. Well, that's not seven. So let's try two. So two plus three is five. And that's not seven, but it's closer, so we're going in the right direction. So you guess, you check, and then you try again. Uh, a lot of numerical methods, in a way, are just that kind of thing. You can guess some solution, and you know you see how close it comes to your answer, and you uh, try again. So a very simplistic kind of guess and check would be, you know, we pick some starting point here. And we check, you know, what, what the value of the function is. 
and we'll say, oh, well, it's pretty negative, that's not good. So we maybe we add some interval and we come here and say, oh, well, it's still pretty negative, but we're getting closer. And then finally we get over here and suddenly we find, oh, now it's positive. Since we're looking for the zero, we know, okay, between these two, we have a root. So then we can start moving backwards and we decrease our interval and we keep, we, we hone in. Uh, this is, uh, this will work. Uh, it's kind of tedious, <laughs> although, uh, like where we're going, obviously if you have a computer to do this work for you, it, it might it might be all right. Uh, again, it's not very efficient because we have to keep checking values and uh, it doesn't converge very quickly, which is what we want. We want to use less computer time. Uh, so then, you know, we come to Newton. Come to Newton's method. So the idea behind uh, Newton's method is that if we have some function, and this doesn't really matter, like, and it goes through a zero, that if you look at the function nearby that zero, it's not a straight line, but it's close to a straight line. So if it were a perfectly straight line and we, we knew its slope and we picked some point on it, you know, we could just extrapolate you know, where it goes to zero. Uh, but of course it's not a perfectly straight line. Uh, but again, it might be it might be close. So what we could do is we could pick some starting point. We always have to do that. We just have to take a guess. And we could find its, uh, since we know its derivative, we could find its slope. So we have a point and a uh, you know, slope. And we can extrapolate and find a point near the root. Okay, I, I guess it's worth taking a minute to just go through that calculation. We have some point, call it x1, y1. We know the point slope form of the equation. It's uh, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. We know approximately, well, we know what m is at that point. It's just f prime of x. And 
we know we know uh, we want to find this point on that line, which is going to be zero comma everything. So we can plug in for x zero. And uh, the slope here is just f prime at x1. That's our approximation. I'm sorry. I said that completely wrong. <laughs> Forget what I just said. <laughs> we know we're looking for this point where y is 0. y is 0, uh, we're going to have y minus 0 equals f prime of x times x minus x1. So our x, we can solve for x now, right? are close enough together, then we're done. Right? They're not changing very much. Uh, that's usually the case. It could be that something's converging very slowly, and that might give you uh, an inaccurate answer. The other thing you can look at is you can estimate the function at that, uh, at that you know, x of n see how close it is to zero. And we're also going to do that. Uh, so this is an iterative process. Uh, it has a really big flaw. It, first of all, it depends on your guess. You give a good guess, you can get uh, a good result. Okay, if you if you give a bad guess, you might find that instead of uh, you need uh, an example of a function, 
So if our function looks like this, well, if we choose here, we're going to get closer and closer. But if we start guessing up here, well, now our first guess is way out here. And who knows what the function does here. We may, we may go off in all sorts of directions. Um, I think in particular, what you want to look for when you're guessing is, is there a point of inflection between you and you know, the solution? Because the point of inflection, there's a good chance that the curve, having now kind of changed its concavity, is now, Newton's now going to give you worse values. Uh, so, okay, that's, that's in a nutshell Newton's method. We just find a guess, plug it in, and then we compare uh, the results, and we also can compare how close we are to a zero. Now, this has for a long time been a popular calculus topic. It's, uh, it's an easy example of a numerical method. Uh, we don't use very many numerical methods in, in this class, but it's, it's kind of like a, it's an introduction. So you can get an idea how these things work. But you know, if, if it was like 30 years ago, and all you had is maybe you have a calculator handy, and you've got some spare time, you know, okay, this is, you might want to do this. Today, nobody's going to do this. They're either going to find a computer program, or they're going to write a computer program. Right? And it's, it's not that hard. Uh, let's uh, take a look here. Uh, 
this program is here. I, I don't expect people to go and do the homework and grind through, you know, these iterations. You are welcome to use this program, you know, get the results off of here. That is to say, I want you to kind of understand the method, but there's no reason. There's no reason to, you know, work your work your fingers on your calculator. Um, all right. So what are we going to do now with all this? Well, I thought. Since the, the calculus is kind of easy and straightforward, but we're using this technology, why don't we just take a look at this technology now for a minute? This is not a computer science class, but uh, everybody here is, you know, everybody, not everyone, but most of you have a mobile device. It's a computer. Uh, there's some laptops on people's desks. We're constantly using them for homework. We might want to know a little bit more about computers. Uh, I realize for some of you, uh, this, this may be a little redundant. You may be aware of most of this, but maybe there's something here that uh, you haven't run into before. I think I'll leave Newton's formula up. Okay, so brought in a historical artifact. Anybody ever seen one of these before? It's, uh, this is my first computer, sort of. Uh, it, it was mine, and it was the first, but it was only sort of a computer. It, it doesn't have much memory. Like your your uh, laptop probably has a minimum of four gig nowadays. Gig yeah, that's like a thing you go and get a creepy job. No, no, it's a billion. This uh, a billion bytes. You know, a byte is eight bits. This has three bits. So it's a very simple computer. You can't actually do stuff with it. Most computers are electronic. They work with electronic signals. This is mechanical. Uh, it's broken. It doesn't actually work. But if it were working, you can manually push this in and then pull it out. Push it in and pull it out. And that's a cycle. All your computers have uh, associated with them a, you know, some clock. Probably like one gigahertz, four gigahertz nowadays. This is one <laughs> per, well, you get it up to about one second if you were really pushing it. But it, it simulates an electronic signal. Uh, it is programmable. Uh, if, I don't know if you can see there are these little straws here. And these little straws, you put them in. And then also the back has little straws. And you can program this to actually do things like you could add two bits. You could add a bit zero and one and zero and one and see what you get. Although clearly if you add one and one, you get zero, but there's overflow. And it doesn't handle overflow. So uh, part of why it's, it's uh, not functional is it actually needs a little rubber pants. So, you know, kind of like kind of rubber bands you might have on, uh, on your teeth if you have braces. All right, so this is very simple. Uh, it, it does incorporate some of the really basic things about a computer. And I want to talk about those. Peace fell out. Peace fell out. It's harder. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> needs those rubber bands to keep these in. Thank you. I'm missing two of these. But I, they're cardboard, so I could probably manufacture them myself. Uh, original, probably 
64 version, this was made in plastic, much higher, higher quality. All right, so you've probably heard of a computer having a CPU or a processor. CPU is a central processing unit. And if you're dealing with multiple CPUs, they, they, they might call them cores. Or you might call it a processor. Uh, it's kind of the heart of your computer. It's an electronics. It's, uh, although they don't look like wires, it essentially has a lot of wires and uh, silicon circuits. flip-flops, uh, transistors, a lot of transistors. Uh, it talks, and sometimes it has its own memory, but it typically talks with structure called memory. You're probably familiar with that. Again, if you buy a computer, they ask you how much memory do you want. And memory is just bits. this memory and tells the memory which bits it wants by another number called an address. So the first bit is, well, the first bit is zero. The second, uh, or the eighth, the eighth bit, the zeroth bit would be zero. The eighth bit would be, the first byte would be address one, and then two, and so forth. So the CPU is able to access this memory. It can read it, it can write it. Uh, and then the other, the other part of the computer is what we call the peripherals. That's kind of everything else uh, that interacts with the outside world. So for example, uh, keyboards, two numbers in memory, one piece of memory somewhere else. They're very simple. What the, what the CPU is doing, uh, it's just very, very simple. And uh, there's a language involved here. Uh, the first part of the instruction is what we call an opcode, operations code. And uh, this has a language which is called machine code. If you looked at the machine code, you would see a bunch of numbers. It would, it would be really hard to interpret. You could, you could look up in a, in a manual what each opcode was and what each instruction was doing. But generally speaking, human beings do not program in. Uh, sometimes we look at machine code uh, if you were doing that, you're, you're doing something very specialized, not very normal. Uh, these instructions, the, or I'm just going to call it a program, because that's a more 
familiar term. Itself is just some data that has to reside in memory, but it's also operating on the memory itself. <coughs> so, for example, if you show an image, a graphic image of something, uh, cuts out in memory, uh, and the instructions are, are doing something with it. Uh, they might send it off to, to your screen so you can view it, or you, know, you might be adjusting that picture, you might be adjusting the contrast. Oh. All right. Um, bring this back to Newton quickly. Uh, clearly, one of the things the computer does is it does these executes these instructions very quickly. And uh, some of these instructions involve uh, evaluation. It's something equal to something, something greater. Uh, and also uh, what we call transfer of control which means we're going through this program, but at some point we decide to branch somewhere else, or maybe branch backwards. So that means we can, we can do loops, and we can do the same thing over and over very quickly. That's something that computers are really good at. Now if you think about it, the Newton problem is exactly that. We have some calculation, and we want to do it over and over and over again. So uh, we ought to be able to get the computer to do this for us. There are hundreds of different languages that people have used or continue to use. But there's some very common ones. A uh, very popular one here in college is Python. Uh, if you're interested in computer science, you probably know that there's an important language called C and an uh, extrapolation of it called C++. Uh, There's also something you might have heard of called Java. And there's something called JavaScript. These are, these are uh, some of the more common languages. Uh, even languages that are kind of secondary start to infiltrate. Uh, I can't keep up myself, but I know that there's, there's something called Go, which uh, is associated with Google. Rust. I don't know what these are. <laughs> I can't. I don't, I've been a professional for 35 years in this business. Up with all the, all the new innovations. Uh, however, how these things actually run in a computer uh, varies. There's a few different ways these can operate. So. Uh, the computer only knows how to talk in its machine language. So whenever you're, whenever you're running a computer, that's what you're doing. So you might think, well, how, you know, of what use are these? Or of what use are these? So some of these languages, I'll just use C and C++, are called compiled languages. That is, there's a program, it's called a compiler, and it takes your program that you wrote, that you typed into an editor, 
It runs it through this program, which is running machine code. And uh, so the input is C or C++, and the output is machine code, which you can actually run. So you can think of it this way. Let's say you go to France, and uh, you're walking around and you don't understand the signs. But before you get there, you, you buy a book that someone wrote, a dictionary, and it, it lists all the, all the uh, various things you might see in the signs. So you look, you look up each sign, and you, know, you have the translation there for it. It's already done. Okay, so that's one way to run a program. Uh, other programs, I'm going to, I guess I'll just put a little asterisk, Python, JavaScript. Uh, sometimes these are called script languages. So again, there's a program associated with them. Uh, in the case of Python, the program is called Python. Or in the case of JavaScript, what they call it. It's like buried into your browser now. Uh, but this again is a program which is just running machine code. It looks at each line of your Python or your JavaScript and figures out how to implement that in machine code and then it, it executes it. Uh, this is called interpretation. As opposed to compilation. Uh, this would be like going to France with your best friend who knows how to speak French. And you get to a sign, you'd say, what's that sign say? And you would go, oh, it means you know, the bathroom the restaurant. Uh, it's a little slower to do this because every time you get to an instruction you have to figure out what it is and then you have to decide, the program has to decide how to, uh, what to do about it. However, uh, our processors, our computers are so fast today that it, for most things it doesn't matter. If you're, if you're going to do some computation, like, I don't know, engineering computation or you know, science, or maybe some statistical stuff that is very involved, it's going to take your computer many minutes or even hours to do, you probably want to look at a compile language because it's going to, it could be considerably faster. It could be, not necessarily. Uh, all right, so what else do I want to say about this? Uh, uh, there actually is, uh, between scripted and compiled, there's, there's a hybrid. Uh, I don't want to say anything about Python, it's too complicated, but the, the language Java has a compiler but it doesn't compile things to your computer's uh, machine code. It, compi it compiles it to what we call a virtual machine code. It's just a machine code that you can put on any computer, and no computer knows what it does. <laughs> but then you have a program on that computer called the virtual machine, which, you know, the Java virtual machine or the Java machine, and it knows how to, to run the Java code. So you can compile it once and you know, take that program around and find the Java machine for that program and run it. So this, I just want to say this other, other thing besides interpretation and compilation. All right. Uh, So um, I want to 
to take a look at the program. It's not very, not very complicated. I want to look at the program that I showed you and uh, just give you an idea how it works. Uh, there's, an, there's an added complication that I don't want to be a complication. In, uh, well, all right, wait a minute. I'm jumping the gun here. I want to first, I want to first do something that if you were a programmer and you were giving an assignment, you might do, uh, which is uh, you would create what we call pseudocode. Uh, it's, it's kind of the same if you're writing uh, an essay for an English, and instead of just starting to write the essay, you write an outline. It's kind of an outline for a program. It, it should be pretty easy to understand, but it, it's not in the computer language. It's just to help you think through it. So uh, I'm going to write a little, some pseudocode here uh, and explain what it means. Uh, I'm going to have some variable I'm going to call accuracy. I'm just going to give it some value. And I'm going to have a starting value. And call it A1. And uh, this is the program that you know, we actually saw. I'm going to give it a starting value of 2. And I want to keep track of how many times I have to go through Newton. So I'm going to have a count variable. I'll start that at 0. And I'm going to have some variable which is going to be the uh, the current version of x that I'm using. So I'm going to call that a current. Well, that's going to be my starting value, so I just set it to a1. And now I actually want to compute. Well, I'm going to compute within a, a loop. Right? I'm going to repeat this over and over again. And I'm going to compute a new value of x using my formula. I erase. That's all right. Write it back. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, this is the pseudocode, so I'm going to just say calculate function. Right. What I want to do first, I want to take my current, subtract, calculate function for a current. And I have to divide it by calculate derivative a current. Okay. Now I want to have some condition for stopping. So I'm going to say if absolute value of a new minus a current is less than my accuracy, stop. In other words, I calculated a new value. Uh, it's close enough, so I'm just going to stop. Well then, uh, 
I'm going to end my loop here. But there's something I have to do first. See, I'm, I'm always executing on the current value, sticking it in the new value. But I want to keep going, so I'm going to set the current value equal to the new value. So I have this nice loop. I calculate a new value. If it's good enough, I stop. If it's not good enough, I just make the new value the current value. And then my, my computer language is going to pause the computer to just keep doing this until it gets accurate enough. Now, This would probably be a bad program if I just wrote it this way and didn't check. Because as I told you, Newton's method may just kind of go off on its own. It may never, may never converge, may never give you a value. So I probably should have a statement here, if count is greater than a thousand, stop. Uh, and then finally down here, I, I'm, I run out of room. I, I guess I'll just say print results. Now, what this pseudocode, yes? Are you incrementing A1? Are you incrementing A1 somewhere in the loop? No, no, I just, that was just like the input, the starting value. I don't, I don't really use it. I, see, we have somebody who's really good with computers here and she knows, I don't need it, right? Yeah, yeah I don't need it. Yeah. No. Uh, well, as far as my input and output communicating with the world, I just kind of hand, hand wave here, print results. But I didn't tell you how I got these into the computer. Uh, I guess I could write the computer, put my starting values in, and run it. You know, I either compile it or just run it. But if I didn't want to change it each time, I'd, I'd, have, to, I'd have to have some way for the you know, the human person to get the information in. And we, we generically call that a human interface. Uh, so this, this program that I actually wrote, and I'm going to show you, uh, it's a web page. And so the, the interface is, Interface is I've got a browser running. Okay? I have say Google or Firefox is running on here. Somehow uh, I let you enter numbers, and that actually goes off to a server program, which is actually where this program is running. Uh, I don't want you to feel like you're going to be asked to write a program, but I do think it's just worth a couple minutes to you know, give you some some buzzwords, some things. You've probably heard of some of these things. Uh, the program that's running on the browser is uh, well, it's written in a language. Well, it uses typically a language called HTML. Anyone heard of HTML? Okay, it's a so-called markup language. And uh, the way it looks is you see what they call tags. You actually should see at the beginning of every HTML program a tag for HTML. And then they have an end tag, which just has a, a backslash and the same thing, HTML. Let me go with this for just another minute. Uh, most of the things you see in HTML are just to put stuff on the screen. So I could I could say typical uh, tag or div. I could put you know the title, and the title will show up on the screen. Uh, 
Some of the tags, though, allow you to enter things and send the results off. And the particular tags that do that is a tag called form. And inside the form, you have tags called input. And the input can have uh, kind of little parameters, ID, uh, you know, start value, it's ID or name. And you can enter something, and it'll send that those two things. The start value is whatever you want it to enter. So uh, we'll run into this in the program, but uh, this is just the human interface. It's not really that calculation. So. All right, why don't we take a break? Take a break for five minutes. Questions in the meantime? Again, this is not a computer science class. Uh, you're not going to be asked to write computer programs. We're just going to take a quick tour through this program. Uh, a lot of it, most of it, can be ignored. And I'll try and get us past that. Uh, the program is written in a language called, script language called PHP. And uh, one piece of useful information if you're looking at a PHP program is if you see a dollar sign, that's what we call a variable. It represents some place in memory. So uh, this, this guy requests x5 equals 0. It's just a place in memory that I'm, I'm setting up. Uh, the first part of this program is just uh, trying to keep the program from messing up if you mess up when you run it. Uh, uh, it just sets some default values. If you run it without, uh, without uh, entering any values, it sets up a default problem that comes from the book. Uh, I also might say, I, I kind of made a mistake I was in a hurry and I would rewrite this. I wouldn't call these variables x5 and x4. They're the coefficients of my polynomial. I don't think x is a good name for them. It should be like a something or c something. But just kind of get overlook that. Uh, unfortunately, runs through the program. Uh, so uh, in my in my pseudocode. I had some uh, you know, calculate function. Well, that's that's my function do calculate. Uh, we're not executing it now; I'm just installing it. And uh, I give it these coefficients. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me back up. 
this is this is a kind of a general function that's that's going to. It's gonna, I think it's going to calculate my next value. I'm going to ignore this for now because we can do that. Uh, I don't need to know what do calc does. Well, okay. So here we have uh, here we have that HTML I was telling you about. It's going to put a title Newton's method. Uh, it's going to has a form which allows me to send values to my you know the computer that's actually going to execute it and. Funny thing, x sub five. That's just why I have an x with a superscript five displayed on the screen. And uh, okay, so so this is going to be all those numbers you saw from here. This is where I'm just setting this human interface up so you can enter these. And you notice I put a calculate button here. I'll show you where. So uh, here I'm just renaming my inputs to nicer, nicer names, x5, x4, x6, x0. That's my coefficients. ACC is how accurate I want it. Yes is my starting guess. And I do a little, a little magic here that tells me that they hit the calculate button. They hit the calculate button, I'm going to call what we call a routine code called do calc, and I just pass it all the all those numbers that uh, you entered. So everything up to now is pretty forgettable. Uh, I just want, I want to look at this this do calc routine because that's where uh, Newton gets implemented. Uh, there's also a lot of stuff here where it's just output that I don't care about right now. Let's take a look at it. All right. So remember, I was saying we have a loop where we're going to execute Newton today. And uh, I think increment from the count variable is plus plus means add one to count. And I check it. And Actually, I changed it. It's only a thousand now. I didn't want you to have to sit there and make a mistake and see 100,000 results. Uh, if, if you overshoot it, it's going to stop and say, hey, let's start and guess. Try again. All right. <clears throat> so instead of my A new and my A current, I have variables X new and X current. And uh, so remember that formula. Uh, 
uh, a n plus x, n plus 1 equals x sub n minus f of x of n over f prime of x of n. So here I tell it to calculate, uh, calculate this new value. It's the current value minus, and here I call a function, calculate function, which is going to figure out my polynomial function. And I divide it here by something called calc derivative, which is going to calculate my derivative function. Uh, and then I, I output the display so you can see it. And I check is the absolute value less than how accurate I want it. And instead of saying stop, I say break. And here's that magic moment where I, you know, I'm going to go through the loop again. So I make my current value a new value. So I'm going through the loop, getting better and better values. So that's it. That's really all I wanted to show you about, you know, the internals of the program. If you're interested in computer science and you take a class in programming, you know, this is all seem trivial, it's be easy. But uh, it's good to know that behind the scenes, you know, every day we have things like this running. Uh, your calculator is going to solve things, maybe use a new method for some things, or we use other numerical methods. Um, your, Mobile phone, millions of lines of programs like this running. Uh, even I see my, I have a video cam running in the back. It's just a computer, right? It's uh, taking the input, you know, the video input images, and storing them, you know, compressing them and storing them on a, on a little SD disk. So we're, we're kind of surrounded by this stuff. It's good to kind of know what's going on, even if it's not your bag, as we used to say in the 60s. Uh, OK, any, any questions about this before we move on? We're not going to work with programs anymore. OK. So really, we just need to know that this is a, some magic program that, at least for a polynomial, will calculate Newton's method for us. Uh, let's, let's try and use it for something. Just 
2x. I'm sorry, I made x to the fifth what? On um, if you go to business. Yeah. Um, on business, you made the x to the fifth. Instead of x to the fifth, you made it at x. So that's good. Uh, Ooh. Thank you. OK. So apparently, there's a 0 around 2.458. And what do we find here? It's uh, Actually, 2.5, 7, 9, 8, 0, whatever. I don't know why we can't roll down. At the very bottom, you can see that within eight iterations, I'm now within 10 to the minus 14th of the zero. Of zero. Uh, and my last two iterations are accurate. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's about eight places. So again, you know, one one could ask oneself, well, why would one want to use not use a computer? I, I can't think of a good reason. Uh, most of the homework you're going to run into, uh, you just can just plug in values and answer their questions. They're only going to ask you to calculate one or two iterations. Uh, there's at least one question, maybe two, where it's not a polynomial function, and then you'll actually have to you know, you'll have to use your calculator a little. Um, I guess we could we could do a, a problem like that. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably worth.